We're going to be reading from the book of Mark, we'll be in chapter 15. And starting there at verse 22, we're told what happened on that day 2,000 years ago. Somehow every Good Friday, that story never gets old. It still echoes. It still draws us to that place where we vividly remember the sacrifice of Jesus. And so we read there at verse 22, they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him, dividing up his clothes. They cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. We heard earlier in the reading from Luke how Jesus appeared before Pilate accused of incitement and rebellion by all kinds of people. And this was the charge against him, that he was the king of the Jews. And when we back up to the beginning of that appearance before Pilate, it starts with that very question, are you the king of the Jews, asked Pilate. And Jesus replies, you have said so. In verses 3 and 4, Pilate reminds him there are many accusations against him. And again, he presses Jesus to answer to these charges. As verse 5 says, but Jesus still made no reply. And Pilate was amazed. This fulfills the prophecy in Isaiah 53. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then as we've already heard, the crowd cries out for the release of Barabbas, a convicted rebel and murderer. Pilate, looking for a way out of this, asks them one last time, do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? And then we have this fascinating verse, verse 10. I've probably read this verse a hundred times. Without, notice, there's some, without noticing, there's something deeply revealing here. Check this out. Knowing it was out of self-interest that the chief priests had handed Jesus over to him. Did you catch that? Knowing it was out of self-interest. Self-interest. The original Greek uses the word envy. Envy is the malicious feeling we, that's aroused when we desire to have someone else's stuff or to be someone else. Nearly every word, everywhere that that word is used in the rest of the Bible, it's in a list of, of sin. Sin of all shapes and form. It's sin. And so in the last few months, we've often used the word autonomy, desiring our will, self-rule, or self-law, our way instead of God's way. We've used that word instead of sin because people don't like to hear the word sin, or they don't understand it very well. But if we're honest, we understand autonomy. We understand envy and self-interest really well. It's been a problem throughout the history of humanity, all the way back to us choosing our way over God's way in the garden. And this is what puts Jesus on the cross. Pilate asks again in verse 12, what shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews? Crucify him. They shouted. And again, why? What crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. So finally, wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. The question for me on Good Friday is always why? Why did they make this choice? Last week on Palm Sunday, we talked about how Jesus arrived in Jerusalem. This is often called the triumphal entry. Only the triumph doesn't look right. Jesus doesn't do things the way they wanted, the way they expected. They wanted a conquering king, but they get a humble king. So what we said last week is that Jesus was not the king they expected. He was the king they needed. Here in our text today, as Jesus stands before Pilate, the story reaches the breaking point. The human desire to have it our way means Jesus must die. This message series is called The Way of the Kingdom. 
We've been talking a lot about Jesus being king, about what his kingdom looks like, what it's all about. It calls for a new way of living, a new way of looking at the world. It's a radical way of living and thinking, characterized by love, generosity, and servanthood, flowing from repentance and faith. It's a radical way of power and authority, characterized by healing, wholeness, and freedom, flowing from the Holy Spirit and from prayer. The problem in the whole story of Scripture is that this way, the way of God and his kingdom, constantly clashes with our way, the way of desire, envy, self-interest, and autonomy, those things that come from our broken human hearts. And so finally in our text today, when they can't stand it any longer, when they're persuaded by themselves that there is no hope, no victory in the way Jesus demonstrates, they ask to have it their way. Both in history and our world today, it's not hard to see just how far us humans will go to have our way. War, hatred, murder, deceit, we'll do whatever it takes to remove, to silence, to destroy whatever stands in the way of us having our way. And so for them, Jesus must die. And in what is one of the most surprising and amazing acts throughout all of history, God allows this. Because it's in this unexpected way that God will accomplish what has always been his purpose, to save creation. When sin enters into the story of humanity, the result is despair and death. The direction of our corrupt and self-interested ways of thinking and acting put us on, when we live our lives opposed to and separated from God, it puts us on a trajectory towards moral destruction and eventual death. But when Jesus dies on the cross, the result is life and hope. And I get it. When I, when I say that, I know it sounds illogical. How can death bring life? I like how one author puts it. It's like being taken off one set of train tracks that leads to death and put on another set of train tracks that leads to life. Jesus dies to conquer the power of death and evil in our world and in our lives. He surrenders his life in our place, like Barabbas for Jesus, the guilty for the innocent. He takes on what we deserve, the full consequence of God's judgment of sin. And Jesus dies as the once for all sacrifice that was needed to overcome the faithlessness and corruption of creation. So yes, death opens the way to life and we have hope because now nothing separates us from the source of all life. We can be reunited to God. The death of Jesus reverses the curse of sin. Jesus' death accomplishes what is and has always been God's purpose, to save the creation he loves. Even though we didn't want him, though we despised and rejected him like the prophet Isaiah says, Jesus does exactly what we need most, the thing we could never do on our own. Jesus pays the price for our sins. Again, we said last week, we need a king with power and authority over sin, a king with humility and compassion for sinners in the world. We need a king who can save us from our sins. We need a king who can give us peace and a king who can heal our hearts. All of those outcomes are impossible without the cross. Jesus goes to the cross to fulfill every single one of those things and finally, finally it's fully revealed to us exactly how Jesus is the king we need. The cross reveals Jesus to be the king, the king we need. We're going to continue with the story in scripture in just a moment. I'm just going to allow it to speak for itself. And we'll see how the cross reveals that Jesus is the king we need. Because it's there that he fulfills and accomplishes his mission. Even though this is nothing like, like what they or like what we might have wanted, or might have expected, it is there at the cross where Jesus ultimately demonstrates that he is the king we need. So let's jump back into our passage in Mark. We're going to continue to read at verse 27. 
They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him, with him also heaped insults on him. You see, it makes no sense to anyone, whether they were rebels, common people, or chief priests, Jews or Romans, it makes no sense to anyone for a Messiah or a king to die like this. The cross was reserved for the worst of the worst, a shameful and horrific way to die. Of course Jesus could come down from the cross to save himself. Surely God could have rescued him. But that was not the reason Jesus was on the cross. It wasn't to save himself. It was to save them. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. It's no coincidence, friends, that here at the moment of Jesus' death, a Roman centurion is the first human in the entire gospel of Mark who recognizes who Jesus truly is. Surely this man was the son of God. Son of God. Mark calls him that in the first verse of the book. The demons call him that twice. But it's not until this point, Jesus' death, that any human is able to recognize who Jesus truly is. What Jesus accomplishes in his death on the cross reveals who Jesus truly is. Jesus dies to save creation. Sin is defeated and the curtain is torn in two. The way to God, the way to life and to hope is freely open to all who, like this Roman centurion, acknowledge that Jesus is the king, the king that we need. And Good Friday calls us to remember that sacrifice, to acknowledge in confession and repentance that we too have acted as though Jesus is not the king that we wanted or needed that we've rejected him, admitting where we've tried to follow our own ways, seeking our own desires, our own self-interest, silencing the call to acknowledge that Jesus is the King, the Son of God. The second verse of the song we sang earlier, How Deep the Father's Love for Us, it captures the reflection we face so well today. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders, Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. Today we again come face to face with the cross and with the sacrificial death of Jesus, which reveals so powerfully how Jesus is the king that we need. Perhaps today you would admit that need. Maybe it's for the very first time. That for all this time, you've been trying so hard to make it on your own. You've pursued success, family, material things, relationships, whatever it is. And still somehow those things have left a sense of emptiness. That something's missing because there's nothing in this world that can meet the deepest need and longing of your soul to be united in relationship to God, the one who created you, who created everything 
the one who has purpose and a plan for your life. If that's you, I want to tell you that Jesus is the king you need. That you can turn to him today in faith and repentance and he will fill you with his spirit and give you hope, new purpose, and a wonderful meaning for your life. If that's you today, please don't leave this morning without speaking with one of our staff team, speaking with someone at the Welcome Center or filling out a connection card online. Maybe today you've already made that decision to follow Jesus, but there's parts of your life where he hasn't broken through. You've held on to parts of the world that you still wanted and not really allowed Jesus to be in control, not really allowed him to be Lord of your life, haven't really allowed him to be the king that you need. But if that's you, I want to tell you that Jesus is the king you need, that you can turn to him today in faith and repentance, and he can lead you to freedom and transformation as you surrender to him, as you allow him to be king and Lord. And you willingly turn over those things you've held on to for so, so long. And finally, there's those of us who did today who, who know that this following Jesus thing is, as Eugene Peterson, he's the author of the message translation of the Bible, Eugene calls it a long journey in the same direction. Maybe that journey has you tired or worn down. Maybe it's revealed to you some habits or patterns that God is still calling you to surrender And I think if we're really honest, we all have something we run to, something that we think will make us feel better when we struggle to live in obedience. If that's you, I want to tell you that Jesus is the king you need, that you can turn to him today in faith and repentance, and he can lead you to renewed strength, renewed power to live fully alive in him. We've heard today how the cross reveals that Jesus is the king we need. Jesus died to save all of creation. He is the only one who saves us from our sins, heals our hearts, brings us peace. He's torn the curtain and opened a way to be in right relationship with God.